Funding for New Mexico in Focus provided by viewers like you. Thanks for joining us this week. I'm Gene Grant. Well, I won't be announcing myself as host because as they say, all good things must come to an end. And more accurately, even fantastic things must come to an end. And so it is for me as your host of The Line here on New Mexico in Focus. Tonight we wrap nearly 20 years in this seat weekly with a special remembrance with friends, colleagues, and you. We'll have two roundtable discussions to talk about journalism then and now and what has or hasn't changed since then. We'll also take a look back at some special programming we've brought your way, some of the very special moments I've been able to enjoy, and a final word from me to finish. But everything and everyone has to start somewhere. Longtime viewers, you may recall the name David Aliri Garcia, a wonderful journalist doing great things right now for Reuters News Service. Here's David and I back in 2008, opening the brand spanking new New Mexico in Focus. Election 2008 ends in a landslide. From Barack Obama's groundbreaking presidential win to a Democratic sweep in New Mexico's congressional races, there's plenty to talk about. Ah, uh, there is. The best analysis and insight on the election outcomes and what it means for New Mexico headed forward in a show that's involved, informed, in-depth. It's New Mexico in Focus. Highlands University President Manny Aragon may be back to practicing law every day. The mayor wants your kids to be flipping pages after school instead of jumping rope. And the Wilson Madrid race just got a little warmer. Higher education, after school programs, and politics tonight on the line. That's a promise of our We well, have to remove the cynicism, to... the Stress. left, the right. The rest of us can talk about this till the cows come home. Mm -hmm. Why do you think all of that's going to change? It's, why do you think it's not? I'm Gene Grant, your host for the line. Hey, everything has to start somewhere. And I want to thank David Aliri Garcia for all his efforts early, early, early on in the show. That was the number one. That was the first show. It was a long time ago. Now, one of the best parts of sitting at this table for nearly two decades has been the opportunity to meet and speak with so many interesting and knowledgeable people on the line. And this week, I have a really special group. I'm happy to be joined by three people who've played a big role on the Line Opinion panel over the years. And we start with Kathy McGill, someone I've known for years, who's become a key contributor on the program and always a friend. Thank you for being here, Kathy. Next, Cross Table KKOB radio host TJ Trout, who quickly became one of our go-tos, and we've loved having him on ever since. And back across the table, I'm so pleased to welcome Kathy Wimmer. She helped build the show. You don't know her by face, but she was the show, making sure we had the right group to dissect the issues of the week. And she's here at the table to be with us for a goodbye. Thank you so much. All right, thank you all for being here today. Now, I wanted you all to take a look at a clip our producers found. Uh, to our knowledge, my first appearance on New Mexico PBS and New Mexico in Focus, speaking with the show's then host, Kate Nelson. Jean Grant is a freelance journalist and occasional blogger. Jean, tell me, do you think, does the, does the public anymore want journalistic integrity, or are they, are they just looking for news that caters to their own point of view? Wow, that's a great question. I think the word itself, journalistic, or the term itself, journalistic integrity, is just being reshaped so quickly. What is, you know, journalism that has integrity anymore in a blog universe? That's, that's the, the first problem. If you, if you don't have the ability as a reader or as a viewer to kind of have a, uh, a prism to view what's, what's good journalism to look through, how would you know it if you saw it? So who cares? So get it anywhere and it just doesn't mean anything. And it circles back to if it fits my sensibilities in what I want to read and the conclusions I've already brought to the table, then it's good journalism. <laughs> but if it doesn't and it doesn't challenge you in the right way to bring you to another place, I think a lot of people are inclined to see that as bad journalism. And I think that's where we get stuck right now out, out there with uh, how people consider it. Why are fewer people reading newspapers? Oh boy, I, you know, it's, it's really funny. I think it's, it's one of those things you have to sort of have grown up and, and modeled for you at your kitchen table as you're growing up. And I think as less people do that as time goes by, that habit of the daily paper, the thing that we all grew up with, you know, my, my you know, growing up included, you know, reading the Boston Globe every day at about age 11 or 12, which is pretty weird, but that's what was modeled for me. And I think a lot of us just don't have that anymore. We don't see that. And, and since we can just get it on the fly when we need it, 
Why do we need to hear that clunk on the front step of the paper? Well, let's, let's talk about that, that new habit. Um, in, in consuming news on the web, I find for myself, um, I'm getting nibbles of it. Yeah. I'm, I'm a few minutes on this website. I'm a few minutes on that site. It's not like sitting down with the Sunday New York Times and, and devouring a lot of information. What is that doing to our sense of the community? What's it doing to our thought processes? Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting. I don't know how quite yet the inability to sit down and read a 5,000 word piece is, is sort of affecting the culture. You do need time and it kind of has to fit in your life. And I do the same thing. I'm just as guilty of taking those bites uh, on the web. I, I cruise six or eight newspaper websites a day. You can't read them all cover to cover, so you have to take little bites here and there. At some point, the best you can do is get an accumulation of opinions if you're biting and you can come to some kind of conclusion that you, you have a sense of the story, you have a sense of what the issues are. So that's the upside of that, of getting into bites. The downside of that, I think, it, se it seems to me, is if you don't bring that other part to it, the ability to kind of look at all those little bites on the table as a mass at the end of the day or at the end of the, your session, what good is it done? You've just, you, you know, nothing's really sort of sunk in. So it, I think it's an individual thing, but I think for, some, for most folks, I'm just happy they're going out there biting. You know what I mean? <laughs> just, that that pleases me. at least that me. much. Right. Very quickly, well, how do you view your role, your responsibility as a journalist? Um, it's, it's pretty easy for me. Uh, it, when I sit down to write a piece every day, if I can't, at the end of what I write, feel like it's going to be influential in some way, and I don't mean just to provoke, I think that's pretty cheap, but I think to really be influential and bring some new information to someone's sensibilities and how they view the world, then I've, I've failed that reader. i failed that reader, and that's, that's what I think most people who sit down and do this business actually do in one way or the other. Hopefully they still do. Gene Grant, thank you. Thanks for having me. Well, there was a popular play, play back in the 70s, four letters. It's, well, let me see, what was that? <laughs> hair! <laughs> it was hair! Right? There was a lot of hair back in 2005, y'all. There's been a lot of hair since, hair. right? Yes. Oh, man. Like I said, that was back in 05 when blogs were all the rage. Something you heard me bring up with Kate about my concern about confirmation bias. Oh, my God. That if readers didn't like the news they were hearing, they could just go to a different blog or website to reinforce what they already believed about the world. Now, since that interview, the blog era has evolved through social media. 18 years later, it's amazing. The question remains the same. Uh, Kathy McGill, can the average reader or viewer identify good journalism? The kind of reporting that challenges how they think and stuff like that. What do you think's out there on the landscape now? I don't know that, that people really want to be challenged. Ooh, you know, one. that yep. confirmation bias still exists and it's aided by the algorithms that only feed you the news, the things yep. that you want to hear. Yep. So, you know, if you're not a seeker of truth, then right. you can sort of, you know, sit in your bias. That's right. That's yeah. right. A lot of people don't have the patience and time, T.J. Trout, to read a 5,000 word, you know, set piece on a Sunday. Yeah. But folks miss out on a lot. How, how do we make up that gap? What happens? Your hair <laughs> was amazing. It was amazing. <laughs> you were very attractive. That's what we got there. <laughs> <laughs> Hair is powerful. Look, <laughs> many books have been written about hair. So. I, 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 to your, to your question though, um, I, I kind of agree with you about how people don't have, uh, they don't have the patience to sit through a five thousand word piece right. of journalism anymore. Right. And I, I agree with you. However, I slightly disagree with you in the fact that I think 20, 30, 40 years ago, I don't think they had the patience to sit through it back then either. Mm -hmm. They didn't. Yeah. I think, I think yeah. the only people that would sit through and read a 5,000 piece, uh, uh, piece of good journalism yeah. are people who are already fully engaged with the political process mm -hmm. and uh, knew that they had to take the time to do this. Right. I think everybody else, even back then, were, were, were still uh, 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 distracted by shiny things, mm -hmm. uh, TV, and, and life. I mean, That's life right. got in the way of people doing that. That's right, exactly right. Yeah. Kathy Wimmer, I'm so glad you're at the table. Oh, my, my God. My first time at right. the table after all these years. It's amazing all to think about. Because you predate me here. So, you know, we've been, you were well, here actually, a long time. Uh, well, it, it, yeah, you know, we have all a, a, a lot of history, That's a lot right. of history. That's right. I'm curious from your point of view, though, you know, I brought up, you know, something that's still valid today. It's the concern over... You know, how easy it is to get lost scrolling through little bits of information. I mean, it's even worse now. And you're, you had to do that for work here. You had to scroll through so many news sites every week, every Monday, every Friday. Is well, it too much for well, people? That's the thing. I, I, 
I would scroll through a lot of a lot of information, but mm -hmm. I think we need to like look at okay, what are we scrolling for? We want. I am the facts kind of person, yeah, you know. Yeah. And what actually happened? When? Where? Why? What was it? And and that's the important thing. And sometimes you get that information, and if you don't then pass that on, you, like there's a piece missing. That's right. And that's one of the things, that's you know, right. we did a lot when, when right. I even wrote scripts for the line yep. was you got to get all those facts in there and that's the right. pieces that are important. And yeah, yes, it's easy to, to scroll past that, mm -hmm. but you, you, you even mentioned back in 2005 right. on In Focus with Kate Nelson <laughs> um, about nibbles versus uh, a meal, right. you know, and you get right. little mm -hmm. nibbles and that's, that's right. great. But if you're missing like the nutrients of the meal, that's you know, right. you, right. you know, that's a that's a problem. Right. And so sometimes that's what you need journalists to do is mm -hmm. to that's point right. out the, the 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 protein. That's right. You know? I got a question right. regarding TJ Trout. For you, Kathy okay. McGill, let's yeah. say you're listening to TJ. TJ's angle of attack is not to be a news person, to have fact, 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 as Kathy pointed out, right. but to offer a different perspective on the news, a different perspective on the headlines. Does that not count as part of the mix out there? I mean, TJ's filling in a certain sort of a blank there for certain people. I think that, yeah, like your personality, right? Mm -hmm. You have your opinion. We all have our opinions. And as long as it's presented as that mm -hmm. and not presented as fact right. and not, you know, these sort of alternative facts that have become uh, popularized these days, that yeah. people understand that you are expressing your opinion, that they have the ability and that you should encourage them to go out and research for yourself. I always say, you know, don't take my word for it. Go read it for yourself. Mm -hmm. Here's what I think about it. You can agree or disagree. Well, that's what I say all the time. You though. Do. I mean, it, it, yeah. is so, in, in, uh, it is so important on my show, too, mm -hmm. um, to get mm -hmm. the truth out. I mean, mm -hmm. and right. especially these days. I mean, that, that's the whole thing. I think that's, that is the issue of our generation right now. What is truth? Right. I mean, because there are so many different versions of, of what truth is uh, purported to be. That's right. Mm -hmm. you know? that's right. Another big part of this, Kathy had to deal with this as well when she was with us, is that dealing with folks uh, angry about certain facts not being expressed or certain angles of attack not being explored, that kind of thing. The reason I bring that up, Tej, is that people now have a way to get to personalities like you or a producer like Kathy very easily. Mm. Before it was snail mail, when I was doing columns at the Tribune, yeah. you know, people would complain it came in an envelope yeah, right. <laughs> with a stamp on it, you know mm, what I mean? Yeah. They can get right at you right after a show and say you're a bum or me or anybody, you know what I mean? Well, I, How has that changed the relationship? It hasn't changed my relationship at all. And what okay. I learned very early on that I, I generally, I, I call it the, the text line that comes into the radio station. And I don't care if I angry people at all. I call it the abuse line. Yes. <laughs> and you know what it is? It's a bunch of people, generally speaking, screaming from the cheap seats, whatever they want to scream with no, with no filter. And they know if you, if you said something like that to their face, if you, they said something like that to my face, we'd right. have a problem. That's right. You That's know, right. uh, so I, I management has you, to deal with a lot of things here. Not right. An opinion show, believe me. So I try so, to just yeah. keep that stuff away. Keep your head down and, right. and put forth the best product you can and right. put out as much information, good information as you can for people. And hopefully they'll listen. That's right. Hey, folks at home, when our producers went digging for those old clips, it really was funny to find my first appearance was centered around a topic we just packaged into a two-part special, the state of journalism in New Mexico. We just ran that two weeks ago or three weeks ago. Most media outlets don't have the time or resources to turn the lens on themselves from time to time. So, uh, Kathy Wimmer, I want to ask, do you think it's a valuable exercise to reflect on and assess our own industry and maybe more importantly, let people know how we do our jobs. Absolutely, and that was one of the things that I, I, I always was very adamant about when, when because, okay, Gene, you're the Uber host. You, this is the end of an era of you being the Uber host, mm -hmm. but um, you were the host of the, the line and also did some hard, lots of ha right. hard news interviews. That's right. Um, the line is an opinion panel, mm -hmm. and we very carefully wanted to say it's different opinions. Now, you can have alternate opinions, mm -hmm. not alternate facts. Right. And that was your job is to keep that going. But, but the, the audience also wanted to know your opinion, too. That's right. And you would be That's able right. to bring in your opinion with the line. Yep. Um, and and, and you, uh, that's one of the things I always think you were a master at, and I will talk more about that, mm -hmm. um, is that you know there, there's all specialties in, in, in so much of the news um, that you know somebody right. covers sports, someone covers arts, someone covers the you know the good feeling news of the day. Right. And you 
got to do all of them. That's right. And you, mm -hmm. you crossed each one very well. And I mean, and you, you spanned the, the, each topic very well. And mm -hmm. you know, you, you're the master at it. I, I mean, I, I, a lot. yeah, I got to I, I want to you. note on something you mentioned <laughs> uh, in the middle, uh, middle there, and that is my ability to express my own opinion. But that's something I was always very conscious of. You yeah. cannot do that often. There's, there, there are certain times to do it from this seat, but people want to hear people from these seats over here. That's always what you have to keep in, in the front of my mind. And interestingly, um, uh, during a two-part special last month, we spoke about the changing ways viewers get their information and noted that younger viewers, this is interesting, Gen Z and millennials consume the most news while scrolling online. So has waking up and scrolling on your phone replaced my generation's morning routine or starting the day with your morning newspaper? I mean, again, is this a credible way to get your news? It, it, and have newspapers adapted to the shift? Probably more importantly. I, I think newspapers are working very hard to adapt to the shift because they have to. Yes. You know, you gotta have an online presence. And so I, I hope that people are, you know, scrolling through and trying to sample something from a lot of different places mm -hmm. uh, before coming to a final conclusion. That's right. So, you know, get some more eyes on it, you know, ask about what's really going on and read it for yourself. Mm -hmm. Exactly right. TJ. Gene. I think about you often. Mm. You have a question to ask me, I think. Yes, I do. Yeah. Okay. I can see it in your eyes. Well, you know, I know <laughs> you. I can see I, I, you're <laughs> noodling something over I was, there. I'm writing notes over here, Gene. <laughs> um, okay. The, it was interesting with you and Kate Nelson back in 2005 discussing the, uh, discussing the state of journalism yeah. back then. Yeah. Okay, so what, what do you think has changed? I think I know what has changed, but what do you think about the responsibility in 2023 uh -huh for a journalist? Uh, what, yeah. I, that please, tricky, that's a tricky question, some... responsibility. Um, I, I, you know, I believe it's about letting the reader or the viewer know who you are. There's almost a responsibility of that. Mm. Like, who is this person giving me this information? Yeah. I need a little bit more than just a byline, a name, a gender. I need something just a little bit more than that as a consumer for myself. I'm not asking for your political bias. I'm not asking for your background. I'm not asking how you voted. Not that stuff, but I, I do generally want to know about the writer or the presenter. And I think you owe that a little bit to the audience these days. I think back when you didn't have to do a lot of that kind of no. stuff. 100%, I agree 100% yeah. with you. And the thing that, that kills me these days are the so-called journalists who are just throwing stuff out there on social media right. that, that have no training, you know, no, no education really to speak of, right. and they're just full of opinions and misinformation and hearsay. It's hard to parse. It it, really it's is. hard. Yeah. I think you hit the nail on the head when you said they want to know a little bit more about you and right. where it's yeah. coming from because right. it's not just a talking head. Right. It's something, yeah, yeah and, 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 and we, we need that. We need mm -hmm. that communication. That's right. That's exactly right. Thank you all for being here and talking through that. I love it. We're going to be back here at the table for one final discussion at the end of the show to talk about some of our favorite memories from NMPBS and New Mexico in Focus. I know I'm looking forward to that one. But right now, another interview that sticks out in my mind from my time working here. Back in 2014, PBS was airing the hit series from Henry Louis Gates called Finding Your Roots. You might remember. If you haven't seen it, he and a team of genealogists gathered information on the heritage of celebrities and public figures, eventually sharing their findings on camera with them to their surprise. In October of that year, we decided to do something here at NMPBS, inviting genealogist Ruth Randall on the show to tell me a little bit about my heritage that I never knew, and it really was fascinating. Ruth, gotta start with you. Okay. I, my family, uh, we do not know much about my family history because as you know well from African-American research, you can only go so far back and then you kind of get to a stopping point. You're not quite sure where your family roots have come from. So with bated breath, I must ask, what did you come up with for the Grant family? Well, first of all, you have a very interesting ancestry. Ah. Your maternal line is from uh, Cape Verde. Yeah. And uh, the islands of Cape Verde were uh, colonized by the Portuguese mm -hmm. in the mid 16th century and the islands uh, subsequently became center for slave trade. Mm -hmm. Your paternal line is from Barbados, right. the uh, southern Caribbean island, and uh, in the mid 17th century uh, the island brought in slaves to work in the sugar industry. Mm -hmm. Now your father was born in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. Your father's father, Joseph, 
was born in Barbados. Do you know when your father's, when your grandfather Joseph came to the United States? Boy, I, I, I think it was in the teens. I'm not quite sure. Somewhere 18, 1918, 1919, somewhere around there. I'm not exactly sure. Well, he came to the United States mm -hmm. on, in uh, 1923. Okay. Tuesday, July 24th, oh, and wow. he was on the SS Pancras. I'll be darned. What a way to travel. Yes. My goodness. <laughs> uh, on line 21 mm -hmm. of the uh, sh ship manifest is your grandfather's name. Wow. Um, you can see it better on this one. Oh, I'll be darned. Did you know that he, did you know that he was a skilled craftsman? I knew he became a skilled craftsman. I don't know when the crafts when it started, like how we got going. I have well, no when he, when he uh, boarded the ship in Barbados, he's listed as a cooper, huh. which meant he was a uh, maker of barrels and pails or uh, butter churns, uh, wow. wooden vessels. Huh, I had no idea. Yes. How interesting. And then um, on February 1st, 1943, mm -hmm. your grandfather, Joseph, after signing a declaration of intent and uh, uh, giving an oath of allegiance, passing a civics test, was granted citizenship. And here's his signature. Oh, wow. His date of birth and the date of uh, admission. And this is his certification for naturalization. Hmm. I'll be darned. Wow. I've never heard about it. He's never mentioned it, or my dad either. So there you are. Wow. Now, uh, on April 27th, 1942, all men in the United States who were born on or after April 28th, 1877, or on or before February 16th, 1897, had to register for the draft. And it's commonly referred to as the old man's draft. <laughs> so, <laughs> so here's your oh, grandfather wow. Joseph's certificate of uh, registration, his draft registration card, and then your grandmother's name, because that's the person who would always know where he lived. Gotcha. I've never seen his signature before. This is very interesting. Look at that. Now, your grandmother and um, Naomi mm -hmm. and Joseph mm -hmm. married around 1928. Mm -hmm. On November 7th, 1949, she took the same steps as her husband, your grandfather, to become a citizen of the United States. Huh. And so there's her signature. Wow. That includes her maiden name. Oh, wow. And that's the address that I knew them from. That was the, uh, the Putnam Avenue in Cambridge. Now, Naomi's father mm -hmm. was uh, William Adolphus Elder. Huh. Do you know when he came to the United States? I don't. Okay. Uh -huh. Well, he boarded the SS Cuthbert on Friday, March 13, 1914. And uh, his name appears on line, line 19, I think, mm -hmm. of this document, yes. Mm -hmm. And he was a porter at the time. A porter, okay, interesting. He too went through the process to become a U.S. citizen, and so here is his oh. certificate of naturalization. A lot going on with my family in the 19, early 1940s. Well, really, he's, that's a great grandfather. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. And this is great grandmother. Mm -hmm. Now, I think. The information I had, she was always referred to as Alberta, but she was Alberta Elizabeth Elder. Gotcha. And on uh, other documents, she's Elizabeth Elder. Uh, so, interesting. But, you know, here's her certificate of naturalization, mm -hmm. their address, and her signature, date of birth. Wow. No. There you go. Thank you so much. This yeah. is amazing. It was a delight to, to share you. this with you. Thank you so much. This is really quite something. None of this information we have in our family. I don't believe, because a lot, we've all moved around, that happens within yes. life, families move around and things, and, and this, this connects so many dots, I can't even begin to tell you, but I will take that step. I think there's going to be some talk in our family at this point, <laughs> so thank you. Wonderful. Thank you for kickstarting it. Um, it was my pleasure. Thank you so much.
I cannot thank Ruth Randall enough. Information about news and events is one thing. When it's about your family and heritage and pride, that's another story altogether. Thank you so much, Ruth. Speaking of roots, we all need watering of our own roots to grow. And in my business, that can happen when you have heroes to look up to. And without question, there was a hero of mine who helped shape my life as a professional. That would be the late Gwen Eiffel. When I was a young man, there weren't a whole lot of black faces to look up to in the news business, especially female. She was an enormous figure for me. Her work for the New York Times covering the Clinton campaign was a highlight. Her byline above the fold nearly daily was a thing of beauty and an inspiration. In 2010, she came to our fair city for her own book tour for, the, for this called Breakthrough, Politics and Race in the Age of Obama. Great book. If you haven't read it, if you attended the packed event that night that we did, you recall how huge a figure she was for all of us. And sitting down with her at this table honestly was dizzying. I still can't believe I didn't just pass out in front of her. But we made it through, and it was truly, truly a massive highlight for me. On the book, what was your impetus to write this? I mean, there's been plenty of documentation mm -hmm. about the race yeah. in, in 2008, but you're coming from a very different angle very here. Very different. Yeah. People, a lot of people, as you recall back then, thought I was writing a book about President Obama. But in fact, President Obama was just a spark for a story I'd been carrying around in my head for mm -hmm. many years, which is, who are these African Americans who are taking advantage of the breakthroughs that happened during the Civil Rights Movement? I was raised at a time when people were still marching in the streets and sitting at lunch counters. I'm watching a generation of young black kids who are raised who don't know what lunch counters even are. This is not, this is alien to them almost. And even when President Obama was elected, they went, uh-huh, so what? What is happening is something different from what we saw in the Civil Rights uh, movement instead of marches, instead of uh, laws and on the books, we're now, we now see a generation of, of candidates who are taking advantage of the laws that were already passed. Mm -hmm. They're not, they're no longer trying to get laws passed. They're taking advantage of public accommodations. They're taking advantage of access to elite educations, which we see so many of them in this breakthrough crowd have. And as a result, the, the, the impetus kind of changes. It's not identity focused. It's mm -hmm. not identity driven. But what you see when you see them all of a sudden in the mix, not only in Congress and in the White House, but also in state legislatures and in mayor's offices, is that we have now, the word is integrated, mm -hmm. politics in a way that hadn't happened in the 1960s or 70s. An interesting part about the book that I, I got a lot out of, because again, if, if you're either there during that early, those early civil rights struggles or not, what's, what's wonderful about the book is that look at the sandpaper friction you describe mm -hmm. between the Moses generation, those who came up right. and fought the, the great battles, the epic battles, and as you just mentioned, those who hadn't. But the negotiation between those two thoughts are, are a fascinating deal. Sometime between parents and their children. Right. Uh, it's interesting to see someone like, uh, um, uh, someone like Bill Clay in Missouri who broke through and was a, got arrested in civil rights marches, and his son is in Congress but campaigning on behalf of school vouchers, something his father would be completely against. Uh, Jesse Jackson Jr., Jesse Jackson Sr., different approaches to kind of the same goals. So it's interesting to watch what happens. And, and also what happens is, is when you get power, you don't like handing it over. Mm. And that, that's not just if you're African American, that's what happens with the Brahmin and the Irish in Boston. It's, it's mm. just the way it's always happened. But what happens when you've only recently come to power is the friction is that much greater. It's mm. like, I'm not willing to give you that torch yet, even though if you would just wait a moment. All these candidates I talked to were told to just wait a minute, just, we'll get to you. Instead, you now have a generation who's saying, well, that's nice, thank you so much, we respect what you did, but we're not gonna wait, up to and including the president. Mm -hmm. Black politics is one of those unfair questions, but where are we right now? We have a, we have a black president, we've got certainly an, an, some representation, but the amount of women in, in an elected seats, there's been some problem, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, women of color, yeah. I should be specific. And then also for the bench, so to speak, black politicians coming forward to run for national office. Where, where do we stand now? When I finished writing this book, I was very optimistic about this. I think there is quite a deep bench and a bench that we're not aware of. Every time I went to interview someone for the book, they'd say, and do you know about so-and-so? And then I'd go there and they'd say, and do you know about so-and-so? The two black Republicans who were, appointed to con who were elected to Congress this term, I had never heard of them before a year, six months ago probably. Mm -hmm. So the idea that there are people out there we'd never heard of, in 2008, when, and the, when we elected Barack Obama, no one knew who he was in 2003 mm -hmm. before he gave his big speech. So things change very quickly. And I think the bench is deep, but it's not exclusively identity driven mm -hmm. and it's not exclusively 
party driven. I think that can only be helpful. Mm -hmm. I think it could be helpful because so many of the, the kids we're raising, are, we're trying, we're, we're walking this line where we want them to be aware of their history, but we don't want them to be bound by it. Mm -hmm. And if we can elect uh, a generation of politi politicians of color and white politicians too, who see the world that way, mm -hmm. isn't that what we're really striving for? Sure, absolutely. Yeah. The question is, is it appropriate for African Americans to criticize vigorously this African American president publicly? And we do this amongst yeah. ourselves. There's always a good row, you know, amongst ourselves. But, you know, I'm thinking back to when Tavis Smiley was asking some very tough questions mm -hmm. during the campaign mm -hmm. and Cornel West and some other folks. It, that seems to be a, a, a part of the democracy as well. You've got to sure have it is. these arguments. Sure, it is. Somebody's yeah. got to hold feet to the fire, and that's fine. The same thing happened to Deval Patrick in, mm -hmm. in Massachusetts. He just got reelected, but he had a pretty vigorous Republican challenger in Massachusetts this last time. But a lot of his loudest critics, especially early on, were African American leaders who said, wait a second, what's the point in electing if you're not speaking exclusively to us? Mm -hmm. And his response, as is Obama's response and so many of this new generation of breakout, breakthrough uh, figures is, I'm, you know, don't give me such a hard time. I'm going to get to you mm -hmm. if I fix all this other stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and there's, it's just two different ways and two different philosophies of how one speaks to saving one's community or speaking for or representing. I think that we're leaning more toward the former rather than the latter because there are so few, uh, there's so few African American leaders, statewide leaders and beyond, but also because they're still a, we're still a minority and majority society. And mm -hmm. the majority society and anybody, all they want from politicians is for them to say, I will speak to you and I will listen to you and I will speak for you. If at any point, any politician of any color or creed seems like they're only speaking to one group, they lose everybody else. Yeah. And that's the line. She may be gone, she will never be forgotten. Gwen Eiffel, thank you so much. What a wonderful time she had here in Albuquerque and we had with her, fabulous. PBS NewsHour has had a major impact on our station and our coverage over the years. In just a few minutes, you'll get to see some of the big stories I was able to explain to viewers across the country via the NewsHour. But before that, I wanted to share another interview with a NewsHour legend. That would be Jim Lehrer. It's hard to express how thrilling it was for me to not just meet this enormous hero of mine, but to have a sweet, quiet moment with him in our green room is something I'll cherish forever. Now, during this interview, also from 2010, I got the chance to talk to him about some of the major changes that were going on at the news hour at the time. And looking back, I find our conversation interesting for several reasons. As Mr. Lair talks about the ever evolving ways people consume news and how his news outlets must adjust, many of the ideas he touches on are still being thrown around in newsrooms today, including our own. We are very honored to have Jim Lair, host of the PBS News Hour, here in Albuquerque. Thank you for coming and seeing us. Gene, I'm delighted to be here. This, yeah. is, uh, this is as good as it gets for me. Wonderful, wonderful. wonderful. We're here to talk about your book. Okay. And we want to get to that in a quick second, but we would be remiss if we didn't talk about the PBS News Hour and specifically the changes that were recently made and how smooth it was for some folks, but I'm sure it, in your shop it wasn't all that smooth. How, how did it, how did it, or smooth relatively, things are sure. not easy as yeah. they say, yeah. but how did that all work? What was the impetus to make those changes and, and how did that get implemented? Well, there were two things that came together at the same time. Number one was the uh, natural feeling, anybody who watched our program regularly, that realized that this was basically a team effort. It wasn't just about Billy Bob anymore, one person who was the the uh, anchor, as I had been for years with Robert McNeil before that, it was m less about people, uh, one or two people, it was about all kinds of folks, and uh, which was intentional. But I thought that the program needed to, the title of the program needed to reflect that. Now that was one thing going on. The other thing was reality. Mm. The reality of the news business, the reality particularly in the television business, and particularly in the serious journalism business, that we had to think of ways and, uh, and use the new technology uh, to spread our brand of journalism. And yes, continue to be a program that was basically appointment, appointment television program, but also if you wanted to uh, watch us in some other, if you wanted to watch us, watch us on a pink iPod with your name engraved on it, fine. But to expand our online thing, we came to the realization, Jane, that uh, we had a survey that showed that 40% of the people who watch the online news hour never watch the broadcast news wow. hour. 
Forty percent of the people who watch the online, I mean the broadcast newspaper, uh, 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 news hour, never went to the online. So we realized that we had some cross-fertilization to do, and so we expanded horizontally. And uh, now if there's a tweet, we tweet. Mm -hmm. If there's a Twitter, we Twitter. Mm -hmm. If there's any, we're, we're there for, we're using the, mecha the me mechanics, and basically we're talking mechanics. Uh, we're using the mechanics in every way we possibly can without changing the brand of journalism, without changing the thrust of our journalism, but just offering it to people in ways uh, that have been different and more and more, uh, and more and more uh, vehicles. Mm -hmm. Was there resistance inside the shop? I mean, you're talking about Facebook, Twitter, all those kind oh, of sure. stuff. Was it, yeah. Yeah, in fact, uh, uh, some of the old people, and I'm the oldest one there, yeah. <laughs> they wait, wait a minute, do we really want to do this? And I became convinced that, yes, we really did want to do this. Mm -hmm. Because if you really believe in what we're doing, if we really believe what we're doing in public broadcasting, then we have to believe that the more of what we do is, is better not only uh, for our communities and for our audiences generally, if it's a regional audience or a state audience or a national audience, it's also the best for us. It's also part of our mission. Mm -hmm. The mission of public broadcasting has always been to go with the flow, the flow of growth, the flow of need, and my goodness, you talk about a need for, for continued serious journalism, it has never been higher than it is right now. As newspapers all over the country are having uh, uh, real financial problems and they're cutting back and cutting back. And what are they cutting back with? They're cutting back their serious journalism. So those of us in public, we have a, we have a response. It's not just an opportunity that, oh, well, these other people are having their problems. We in public broadcasting should help fill it. We have a responsibility to help fill this. And that means also what we're also been doing and, and the new news hour, uh, the PBS news hour, is, is form new coalitions among organizations, some of them online, some of them print, some of them whatever, uh, uh, and, and to, to amor help amortize our journalism costs. If they're in the same racket we're in, mm -hmm. which is serious journalism, we'll make a deal with you. Mm -hmm. We'll collaborate and amortize the, some of the, uh, the journalism collecting and reporting costs. And so that is, we're in the, it's still beginning. We're still in that. And all of us who are in there have to, ha have to keep our eye on the ball and remember why we're there, and those of us in public broadcasting in particular. How important are affiliates like KNME to that mission? Is, is that all pieces of a whole? It, you know, is the news hour the hub and we're all the spokes out here, but it all adds up to a whole at some level? Absolutely right. Yeah. The, the, the thing about public broadcasting, the word public has never been more vital than it is now. Public means the public in Albuquerque, the public in McKinney, Texas, the public in New York, the public in Los Angeles, the public in Minneapolis, we're all in this together. And local public television stations and public radio stations are realizing with all of us together that we have the means that nobody else has but we, to, to help facilitate this, the, to fill the void that is increasing and in serious journal at the local level mm -hmm. and at the state and regional level as well as at the national and international level. And we are doing everything we can to form collaborations with local public television stations, more than we've ever done this, but we haven't done this before, as well as we should have, and as extensively as we are now. But here again, it's mutually beneficial. Mm -hmm. Let's say there's a, a story in, in, in uh, New Mexico that uh, we believe for whatever reason uh, should be covered on the news hour. Well, it's, it's, it's better from a standpoint of ju just journalistically. The people in New Mexico know more about this story than, some, than, than parachuting in a group from, from Washington on the news hour, number one. But number two, it, just, it, it, it helps both, both sides financially, that we can cover a, pro, a story in New Mexico uh, with KNME than without KNME. And uh, it just, it just it has, makes all the sense in the world. For a barometer of where housing stands across the country, we're joined by four reporters for public media. Gene Grant is a correspondent for the public television station KNME in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Where we sit out here, we've got one out of 675 homes have had foreclosure filings. That's certainly not like you're hearing from our guests we just heard in Ohio and other places, Nevada, Florida. But it's still relatively problematic. We've got over 3,800 homes here statewide in foreclosure. 
For more, we turn to colleagues from across the country. Gene Grant is with New Mexico PBS. Gene? Very similar to what we just heard from Indiana, the last bit of it about certainly Department of Defense and Department of Energy cuts here. You know, here, Ray, in New Mexico, we have so big, so much federal presence, either through military or through our national laboratories. But I'll tell you, if you're, if you're in a, someone's kitchen or dining room, they absolutely know about sequestration. To hear it officially in New Mexico from either the governor's office, the legislature, the mayor's office here in Albuquerque, very, very little at this point. Gene, the Justice Department cited a pattern of excessive force, so they're seeing something that links all these shootings, right? Explain that. You know, it's interesting, uh, you, as you mentioned, there were 37 incidents, 23 of them fatal. And what they were looking for, quite specifically, if there was an unconstitutional pattern of Fourth Amendment rights being violated here, and they were quite strong in their, in their opening statement right off the bat of, of the hearing this morning, that in fact their findings did find in fact that the Albuquerque Police Department had a number of, of uh, uh, situations that they found unconstitutional and did violate those rights. And what that actually did was opened up a lot of dialogue about what, what's going on here, what is the pattern. Solomon Pena, as I understand it, had a criminal history. And there were lawmakers in New Mexico who tried to keep him from running because of that. Tell me more about that. Specifically, his opponent, uh, Miguel Garcia, who held the seat at the time, he was the incumbent, he actually filed in court to keep Mr. Pena off the ballot because he had a felony, felony record. Gene Grant of New Mexico PBS. Gene, thank you for sharing your reporting with us tonight. We appreciate it. My, my pleasure. Welcome back to our special guests this week for one final discussion here at the Roundtable. Over the last two decades, we have covered a wide range of topics on New Mexico in Focus, from historic presidential elections to a pandemic that sent us to a virtual studio. We've been through it all over here. And Kathy Wimmer, as a former producer here, you helped shape the majority of the episodes I've hosted on the line and in focus at the time. What stories have we discussed or guests that we have had that stand out to you? I'm very curious. It's a lot of guests and a lot of oh, stories. There's so many, and <laughs> um, but, but there are quite a few that stand mm -hmm. out with me. And uh, a lot of them have to do with you in the field. Ah. Uh, my v very first time I was in the field with you, and, and, and you know, I'm just one of many. There's been other producers and who have done a lot of this. Uh, so I just happen to be here in the hot seat today. <laughs> but uh, we went out to the golf course when they were thinking of, of tearing down the North you golf course. North? Right. And, and you and I went out there. So, and you know, you were always so good um, in the field. Uh, the Gold Street, when they were trying to put up the uh, uh, big building uh, yes. complex that right. some were opposed to and some were very for. Right. Um, uh, then, and, then, and then Senator Obama. That was Senator, when he was Senator Obama, right. and not before he became President Obama, yeah. and we went to, um, to, to do that uh, conf uh, 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 rally that he That's was right. doing. That's right. And this taught me yeah. a big lesson, and I thank you for the lessons you have taught me about racist behaviors in this country, uh -huh. and right here, is because we all went in with a, a, a full crew, yep. uh, and you were the only one that got uh, pat it down. Right. You were the only one that could pull the side right. and pat it down. That's and right. I thought, here is, yep. thank God he was our first black president. I was very happy about that. Yep. But the people who were, who were security were just, you know, regular right. security. That's and right. they pulled you out. Yep. And that really hit me that, you know, here's a lesson. So I'm going to stop talking because there's a whole bunch more. That's very Others sweet. have other things That's to say. That's very sweet. Thank you, Kathy. I'd forgotten about that moment with the Obama situation. Oof. Boy, oh boy. You've been with us, Kathy McGill, for a quite long time. It's almost unfair to ask you your favorite time here, but I have to ask you, what's been your favorite ever go here when you've been at the table? Well, you talked about some of those historic presidential elections, and yeah. I remember being on during some of those times when I was like, please don't ask me about this one person. Don't ask me any questions. And you always made sure that it came around to asking me about those questions. And then I, you know, of course, had to respond by yelling or doing something like that. And so, <laughs> you know, uh, those things stand out. But just like the opportunity that, that you gave for me to talk about uh, overcoming the tricultural myth in New Mexico yes. and, and what we needed to do to uh, make sure that everyone belongs and to get that information out and for people to understand uh, that that we need to live up to the the 
pledged to our state flag that we're perfect friendships among united cultures. And so I feel like you helped me to do that. And I would just say that, that uh, watching you interview Gwen Eiffel was one of the highlights of, of, of things that I know about you, because I saw that this was your hero. That's right. That, you know, yeah. she was your shero and That's somebody right. that you really respected and you were well prepared and you said, you asked the right questions and, and, and were so wonderful during that time. I was like, I'm proud to know this guy. And I also, you know, will say that I, I sent your national news appearances around to my mom and, you know, to everybody. I was like, I know him. I know him. He's a friend of mine. I have his cell phone number and I text him. And you'll always be my go-to person for politics those late at night times when oh, yeah. I'm texting you to say, Gene, did you see that? Did you hear what they said? It's not over. It's not, not over. over. No, we don't no, no. keep that, doing it. That carries we don't keep on. Doing it. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. TJ, I can remember the first time you sat to my right. It was like, oh man, yeah. TJ Trout's here. This is amazing. This is so intimidating. You've gone through this before, leaving a show. You were yeah. with a 94 Rock for how many years before you left? I was a 94 Rock for 25 years. 25 years. Yeah. Exactly yeah. right. I'm curious what, yeah, I know we're talking about me here, but I don't want, I'm a little embarrassed talking about me here, but just, just in general, retiring from something. Yeah. How did you feel about it? leaving a broadcasting career? Um, I, knew it, I knew it was time, yeah. and maybe you, know, maybe you know it was time too. Yes, I do. But I was uh, scared. Mm -hmm. I was uh, maybe intimidated a little bit by the future, wondering, okay, well, now what? What am I gonna do? What am I going to do with my time now? Uh, and uh, obviously, it didn't last long. <laughs> right. But we, we were talking about the emotion of this, yeah. uh, how, how, uh, how much emotion is involved in this. And, and I was leaving the state. You're not leaving the state. I was right. leaving the state. That's right, that's right. And I remember it hit me. It, I was leaving at Christmas time, and uh, I was alone because my wife had already left. And I was walking through the uh, Sunport to board my plane, just d down, um, you know, and I just burst into tears. Ooh. I was I was sobbing like a little baby all the way down. People were looking at me, like, "What's wrong with you, man?" But um, yeah. it's going to be good for you. Yep, it's going to be good for you. Don't be afraid. Thank you. I mean, you know when it's time. You knew when it was time, mm -hmm. and uh, you, you picked the time. Let me. All right. Let me go back to one more thing because I'm going I'm I'm to flip this around on you. Okay. One of my most memorable experiences with you was on my show, uh -huh. and this was right after George Floyd was murdered, uh -huh. and I had you on. I don't know. I don't know how to. I didn't know how to begin the conversation with you, but we had the conversation. You came on and you succinctly explained to me and my audience personally how you felt about that incident. And you also brought an African-American perspective that I don't think my audience would have been exposed to if it were not for you. Appreciate and that. I will always, always uh, thank you for that. Thank you, it was, it was, It was a big deal. Yeah. I, 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 I appreciate you bringing that up. I do recall it. And, uh, yeah. and I want to turn back to Kathy for a quick sec. We, you and I have talked about this. Don't want to expose you, certainly. But it's important to have black faces out there in a place like New Mexico, where it's 3% mm -hmm. population here statewide. And you've always said, you know, having someone in a black face in this seat has a lot of importance. Yeah. If you can pick up on that for a quick second. I get, again, it's embarrassing to hear you talk about me in this way, but I, it just has to be talked about. Well, you know, I, I think I would phrase it that I'm, I'm mad because, you know, why do you get to go out and have another new experience and I still have to keep doing the same things I've been doing. Um, but I'm, and I'm sad because I know for a fact that I would not have been here um, had it not been for you saying, let's get Kathy McGill on. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe nobody would have seen that I have an opinion about something that's going on in New Mexico politics. I think it changed a lot of things. I see people at the gas station, you know, coming out of restaurants saying, are you that crazy lady that's on New Mexico Focus? I'm like, yep, that's me. <laughs> and, you know, it wouldn't have happened without you. And it's so important. And I think people are proud to say that there's, there is a person here who is skin folk, and we also think is Kim folk. So he understands us and it's like family. And so it's gonna be really, really sad yeah. um, to see you go. But also I gotta say one more thing Please. that, yeah. that I'm, I'm glad because uh, in my other life, I've been a vocalist, right? right. You know, and, um, and so it brings to mind this song um, that says there will be many other nights like this. I might be standing here, sitting here with someone new. Uh, there will be other songs to sing another fall, another spring. But there will never ever be another you. Oh, wow. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> Oof. 
When you've been sung to by Kathy McGill, you've been sung to. <laughs> thank you, Kathy. It's yeah. very sweet. It's yeah. very sweet. Yeah. I want to thank again my man, radio sh host T.J. Trout, Kathy McGill, founder and director of the New Mexico Black Leadership Council, and a very special thank to Kathy Wimmer, former producer here on New Mexico in Focus and The Line. I can't thank you enough for spending your time with me tonight to look back at what we as a team have accomplished during my time here. It has been a team effort, and I do want to thank them properly in a minute, but there's something I would like you to know. The joy of this position wasn't about being in this seat. It was about being out and about and having us, having amazing conversations in stores, restaurants, parking lots with the sun beating down. It didn't matter. I especially appreciated the reveals that many folks enjoyed a glass of wine or a beer to unwind the week with us. It was always very special to hear that. That's the important takeaway for me after 16 years here. It was a conversation a long extended hashing out of the topics we offered up every Friday night, and I loved each and every convo. So much has changed in the media, the city, and all of our lives, so it's deeply gratifying for me when young people introduce themselves and tell me they've been on the couch every week watching along with their parents. These are the kind of people perks that make this experience special, and yes, I've spoken with some big name people at this table, but those folks come and go. We, you and I, remain after they leave as it should be. So let me say from my heart, thank you. Now, we got a lot done here, and by we, I also include the incredible UNM student crew I've been honored to work with. It's been so long, the first wave have careers, spouses, and children. It's been amazing to watch, and to all those students, I say thank you. And I might add also their parents. There's been some wonderful moments with them over the years. And I very much took to heart the deep pride they expressed from their children working here, and that's been special. I'm so glad you got to meet Kathy Wimmer tonight because she represents the amazing production crew we've had over the years. It's not easy to read the ebb and flow of a complicated city in a state like ours, but Kathy and everyone involved did it brilliantly. To all the producers who have been a part of this journey, thank you. To every panelist from show one to tonight, thank you. To the PBS NewsHour, I can't say enough thanks for allowing me to be a participant. A huge honor. To the entire management staff, past and present, thank you for your support and your backbone when the reaction got intense, but especially your willingness to let me grow in this seat. When I look back at how this all started for me, I'm realizing I'm sort of a child, if you will, of a bygone era in television, that late, late, late night one-on-one -on -one talk show. Tom Snyder comes to mind, if you might recall him. And even before that, the occasional viewing when I was very young of the old Dick Cavett show, which kids ran five nights a week live for 90 minutes. <laughs> I love those shows. I actually somewhat devoured them. It's how I learned about the world and it instilled in me a deep love for the opinion-based discussion show. These shows are a grand tradition in the television world because so much gets revealed in the hashing out of news stories, policy, and, and the like. And so it is for the line the same way. This show is and always will be a critical and important segment of our collective understanding of our city and our state. With executive producer Jeff Proctor now firmly at the helm, along with Lou DeVizio, you now know, and team member Antonio Sanchez, this show is headed for new horizons. And I can't wait to have my own Friday night hoist from the couch while holding a beer brewed in Santa Fe. Now, I mentioned Santa Fe specifically to coincide with my new position. I'll be starting soon with Animal Protection of New Mexico as their Chief Program and Policy Officer for Animals in Science. Now, if you know me personally, you very much understand animal welfare is not just a passion for me, but something to put my head down into and work as hard as I did here at New Mexico PBS. So to have an opportunity to join the team at APNM, an organization I have a world of respect for from watching them closely for over 20 years, this is something I could not say no to, which means I will still be around to corner in stores to talk to, but it'll be in Santa Fe. <laughs> Thanks again for joining us and for staying informed and engaged. And I'll be watching along with you next week in Focus.
Funding for New Mexico and Focus provided by the viewers like you.